<clears throat> hey there everyone, That Sexy Nerd is back again, and we're watching more Nostalgia Critic. I cannot believe he's doing The Land Before Time. One of my favorite movies as a kid, man. Oh, it was, like, looking back on it, it's still really intense. I really actually have to show uh, my nephew this. I've been thinking about showing it, uh, it to him uh, for a while, because I don't think he even knows what the land before time is, and I'm like, you're eight years old, man, how do you not even know? <laughs> but yeah, uh, this is, not only that, I, this is like one of my all-time favorite movies, uh, favorite kids movies, like, I mean, Don Bluth really is a treasure, he really, uh, did create some, some wonderful memories with all of his movies, I, I really have to do all the Nostalgia Critic, uh, Don Bluth films, and, you know, I mean, maybe I'll, I will, like, let me know in the comments if you want me to do something like that. Uh, and, yeah, I, I I just, I can't wait to to go over this because I, I want to see how, how the movie impact him and the jokes he can come up with. Because, ooh, there's some emotional, emotional moments in here. And I wonder if he knows the real story because I've learned a lot about this movie, especially recently. Um... That, that it should make for a very interesting episode. So why don't we just get into it? And remember, please, smash that like button if you want to see more sexy and nerdy content and subscribe if you think I deserve it. And let's do this thing, y'all. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy, remember? So you don't have to. And I want to try something a little different with this intro. I want to be a little real with you. And don't worry, I'm not going to play like the sentimental music. I'm, I'm not going to talk like this. Like, don't worry, I'm not going to do any of that. But I, I want to be a little legit with you. A while ago, I posted this video about how my health was doing. I said how I got mm -hmm. shingles and I got past it okay, but it left me with this really bad fatigue and brain fog, and I was told I can't really do anything about it for at least six months. Well, six months have passed, and it's a lot better, but it hasn't gone away. And it's not something that's really awful or anything like that, because there's no pain involved, none at all, but it does start to mess with you after a while. When you get this thing, suddenly it can last a couple seconds, it can last a couple days, and I just feel lost in my own head. It, I can't focus, yet my mind is going to like a million things at once. I'm pretty sure I have ADHD and OCD and they kind of complement each other because I like moving on to the next thing, but I also really love deadlines, so I think that really helps a lot for my work. And I have the greatest job in the world and this is keeping me from my job. It's keeping me from making videos and it drives me insane. And sometimes I can't inform words when it happens. Like I was at a convention uh, earlier this week and sometimes I had to have someone interpret what I was saying because my brain would just not be able to form words. And it's, like I said, not the worst thing, but you can really, really just get lost in it. There are times where I just truly feel lost. Now, why am I telling you all this? Why am I bringing this all up again uh, instead? Well, first of all, I am going to see, you know, an expert on Actually, by the time this comes out, I would have seen somebody already. So, I mean, that that's already happening. But I swear, I'm not doing this to try and get pity from you by any means at all. Because, again, so many people are going through so much worse. But I'm bringing this up because while I go through this, for some reason, this movie keeps popping. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> therapist it's very clear why this movie keeps popping up in my head it's about lost characters trying to find their way back and i'm clearly going through something similar in a different way i haven't been chased by a t-rex yet but my mother's dead <laughs> oh. i can't say that but what's been standing wow. out to me recently about this film is how they portray the journey of being lost Released in 1988 and produced by Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, the there really have been good. dozens of films about abandoned children who have to survive on their own. But Land Before Time, in typical Don Bluth fashion, really made you feel the misery and danger of that journey. Mm -hmm. But again, so you can appreciate the camaraderie, hope, and eventual triumph of such an important journey. If Lord of the Flies is a pessimistic tale about a young hopeful unit becoming predatory animals, Land Before Time is an optimistic tale about predatory animals becoming a young hopeful unit. It, now that he says that too, I want to say also that I feel like I have this huge love for dinosaurs. And even though I would like read books when I was a little kid, I, my parents would give me these big picture books and I just look at them. I wouldn't understand what they're saying, but I'm, I'm reading it. And I try to even learn to read just by learning to read off the, the words. 
uh, of the of the storybooks. It's just just by trying to say these dinosaur names. That's why I could say a lot of these these names really well. <laughs> so um, I. I, I always kind of figured that Jurassic Park opened my eyes to the world of dinosaurs and Land Before Time kind of cemented my love for it, for them, you know? It, it, both of these movies, I saw these movies around the same time in my life and because I, I know I saw Jurassic Park when it originally came out and, and I eventually saw this, I think, in 1995. So it wasn't even that long into my childhood. So, you know, I... It just kind of made the, these those two movies just kind of birthed the love that I have for dinosaurs, you know. And if I had ever, you know, really had the chance, I really would have become a paleontologist. But that would have been a story for another day. I've always enjoyed it a great deal, but I don't know if I would call it one of my favorite movies or anything. However, in this strange part of my life, I find it resonating with me a lot more, and I think it'd be interesting to re-examine it while feeling a little lost in my own head, too. I wonder I if mean, he... must resonate with a lot of other people, because sweet Jesus, they yeah. made a lot of sequels. <laughs> so I should write in and figure out why it made such a connection. You know, I, I wonder if he goes into the, all the details of this movie, because this movie is a lot deeper than you realize. Like, uh, if he doesn't go over it, I'll go over it at the end of the video. This is gonna look weird without a Roman numeral next to it. Uh, you make 14 of these? How do you sleep at night? This is The Land Before Time. The film opens almost like something out of Fantasia, really taking its time establishing mood. It's not even all in yeah. focus, but weirdly that gives it a little bit more of a dreamlike quality. Right. As if you're in a distant memory or a past life or something. Yeah. But spoilers, apparently dinosaurs aren't surviving that great. As food is becoming <laughs> scarce and many are setting out to find a new home. I blame the bunch beetles. <laughs> Several babies hatch, and I think it's impressive how Bluth makes these creatures both a little ugly and a little cute at the same time. They're wrinkly with drab colors, but they also have big, bright eyes with wide open mouths. They surprisingly complement each other. One herd had only a single. <laughs> and again, in typical Don Bluth fashion, even just entering existence can yeah. be a scary as hell experience. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, remember when they said this herd only has one baby? Kinda makes you look at these smashed oh. eggs a little different, huh? Wow, that's messed up. I know, right? Don't be frightened. <laughs> Come out. This leads to the birth of Littlefoot, a great name for a baby, but man, gonna get him beat up in dino school. <laughs> and as he grows, he too sees how scarce food is and follows his mother to a place called the Great Valley. Have you ever seen the Great Valley? No. no. I love that. Sorry, I had to take the roundabout to answer that, but it was more of a face-to-face -face answer. I love that. <laughs> they also discover one leaf left called a tree star, and they decide not to eat it because it's very special. A tree star. <sighs> it is very special. Granted, they never say why it's special, but I gotta dig that. It has a meaning to them, and that's all that really matters. But it's also something you can read different takes on, like it feeds you and gives you energy, but you don't eat it because it's a reminder of what you're looking for. A place filled with many more of them. It kind of makes sense. It does. With that say, if I was in a food famine and someone had a special Snickers bar, <laughs> I'm not even taking the wrapper off before I eat it. I don't care what it meant to you. <laughs> Some things you see with your eyes, others you see with your heart. While they've never seen the Great Valley, the family goes strictly on faith and believe it not only exists, but there's more of their own kind there. I love this. As different types of dinosaurs don't always get along. Three horns never play no, with long necks. Oh, I've seen Dude, this. he said the LN word! <laughs> he stumbles across the same three horn again named Sarah, which I'm ashamed to point out over 25 years later, I never knew was spelled like this. Yeah, oh, it? yeah. It's like the arrow in FedEx. I hate how mind blowing that is. Yeah, that's a weird But I like the mentality time. of even though she acts like she hates Littlefoot, she'll forget about it quickly because, eh, fun is fun. They're approached by a T-Rex named Sharptooth, and I love for as menacing as they make the king of the dinosaurs, he's still not as scary as Don Bluth just drawing a cat. Uh. I'm artistically offended. Littlefoot's mother comes to save him, though, in the most epic battle of keep your kids off my lawn ever. <laughs> An earthquake hits, incorporating to no surprise, a pretty intense animation, yeah. separating the herds and sadly doing in Littlefoot's mom. I always hated that. I always hated that little animation era, though. Like that, it always bugged the crap out.
out of me how the mark that sharp tooth obviously is more in a lower uh, in the middle of her back while in that shot when she like a very emotional moment where she like like is like looking to save littlefoot and grab him it's on the back of her neck and you think they fixed that again when she grabs him but lo and behold it's still on her neck and i'm like what isn't it on her back and then in the very next shot when she's dying it's on her back Duh. it bugs the crap out of me oh better get that spring song from bambi ready <laughs> nope yeah, we ain't pulling that shit here. When a character dies, they let you sit with it for a while. Sad. And it is appropriately brutal. Do you remember the way to the Great Valley? I guess so. But why do I have to know you're gonna be with me? Now just put your kidneys back in your body and we can get going. Uh, I really wasn't kidding when I said it lets you sit with the sadness. For a while. Alpha tries to carry on with the journey, but breaks down in front of another dinosaur named Ruder. Voiced by Pat Hingle. Hey, what's going on here? What's your problem? You're not hurt. So this is gonna sound really weird, but this is my favorite performance from this actor. Really? I don't know, maybe I haven't seen him in enough roles, but whenever I see him, he always plays the bumbling, goofy guy. Even when he plays a part with dignity, they end up turning him into a doofus later. Here, though, his voice carries a lot of toughness, but also a lot of heart. It is nobody's fault. The great circle of life has begun. Not all of us arrive together at the end. At first he's like, what's your problem, you Gen Alpha safe space? But then he puts together what's going on and convincingly, as well as warmly, changes. Oh. I see. <laughs> I see. I knew I was gonna cry. The music, the dialogue, the animation, the acting. Truth be told, this is my favorite part of the movie. Uh -huh. Everything just works exactly how it's supposed to and creates a genuinely emotional moment. I miss her so much. She'll always be with you, as long as you remember the things she taught you. I love, too, that he just leaves them there. <laughs> He's like, well, we're still animals. You're not stealing half my food. There's still a harshness to it. Even when it tries to have a cute bit of levity with these pterodactyls fighting over food, the movie's like, oh, yeah, don't forget this kid's a mother's oil. sleeps in his mother's footprint because sweet Jesus, but then he stumbles upon the tree star from before, swearing he's hearing his mother's voice. Follow the bright circle oh. as the great rock that looks like a long neck. But try to get there early. They always dress him up weird for the holidays. <laughs> I think it's cool we don't know if Littlefoot is actually hearing his mother or if he's just remembering what she told him, like Ruder said. Right. Mother! But it's okay. Look, Mama's still alive! Oh. Mama's still alive! Mama is dead and this movie is cruel! Come on, Bambi was onto the Lola prototype by now! Sarah! Okay, Sarah. Good. Old friends will set aside nope. their differences and team up. Go away. Three horns can be very dangerous. Even the plot of the story, the only thing giving a glimmer of hope is like... <laughs> yeah, not yet. <laughs> Man, this stuff doesn't hand out its happy ending like it's candy. It makes you work for it. Double shifts. Hello. We do finally get some levity with a character named Ducky. And yeah, admittedly, it is hard not to feel bummed seeing this character when you no. know the actress's story, but her yep. performance truly is one of genuine joy yes. and charm that I think it makes sense to mainly focus on that. I'm a long neck too, see? And I have a long tail like you. Though he says they should stay apart because they're different, she doesn't take no for an answer, and Littlefoot, almost halfway through the movie, finally has a friend. Mm. You want to go with me? Yeah! Oh, okay. oh, oh yes, 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 yes! They discover another friend named Petrie, a pterodactyl who can't fly and who, like the others, was separated from his family. Boy, his path is like the yellow brick road for orphans, huh? <laughs> I, I flied? No, you followed. I fall. <laughs> I'm afraid if I can't fly, the only other thing to survive is a cockroach, and I want to evolve into that! <laughs> what? Really? Sarah stumbles across the body of Sharptooth, and yeah, let's add playing with corpses to the list of messed upness <laughs> yeah. this movie's creating. <laughs> yes, Sharptooth and Sauron have very similar DNA strands. Yeah, very. Sharptooth arises, scaring Sarah away, while Littlefoot and the gang do their own corpse desecrating. Yet, what was the story with this guy? And they run into Sarah. <laughs> I met the Sharptooth! Sharptooth is dead! And so are all his grandchildren! <laughs> They don't believe her, but she decides to join the group anyway, as they stumble across another new friend, Spike. 
You are all alone. Are you not scared? Yeah, nice we go from lost children trying to find their parents to, hey, this one's parents aren't even in the picture. Yeah, oh, whether they live voluntarily or involuntarily, nothing would make this a happy scenario. <laughs> We're going to the Great Valley. You can go with us. Thankfully, though, Spike is pretty laid back, never talking and just going with the flow, stuffing his face along the way. If t-shirts existed in this time, this would probably be the one he would wear. <laughs> they found the Great Valley, but it's just a small <laughs> collection of trees that are quickly eaten up. They try to find what they can, with everyone teaming up to get food. Well, almost everyone. Your looks so ridiculous! <laughs> so, um, eat Sarah? We're all agreed to eat Sarah? <laughs> Sarah tries to get her own food, with Littlefoot helping out, without ever letting her know he's helping out. See? I can take care of myself. Well, I think you can make the argument this isn't exactly good team building. You can also acknowledge they're kids and admire Littlefoot's attempt to be nice. Yeah. This is why I like when stories like this are done well. If a main character makes a mistake, they're young, they're still growing and learning. It's not like when an adult makes a stupid decision, you're just like, that dumbass should know better. Mm -hmm. If anything, with younger characters, they become more endearing through their mistakes, if they're handled correctly. And literally, at the end of the day, it is the rest yeah. of the group that eventually goes to rest with him because they trust him and because he accepts him with open arms, including Sarah. They're sweet, believable moments. <laughs> Shit gets real, though, yeah. when Sharptooth attacks, proving Sarah was right all along. Though they escape, this creates a rift in the group, as Sarah wants to go an easier way despite all the landmarks Littlefoot was told about, leads them in a different direction. Damn. Again, when the kids fight, especially when they're exhausted, it feels real. <laughs> they feel vulnerable, like actual kids are, letting their emotions get the best of them and not always knowing if they should reel them back or not. Not only are they lost physically, but they're also lost mentally, not always knowing where to go or who to trust. Sarah's way is easier. <sighs> I think so, too. Ah, uh, this must be the American side of the continent. <laughs> but it turns oh, out Sarah's wow. way leads to Dragon's Lair, where our heroes are trapped Dragon's and have to be Lair. saved by Littlefoot. They even save Sarah, pretending to be a giant tar monster. Yeah. Sarah, <laughs> it is us! <laughs> I don't even know how they yeah, did all Let's be careful how we animate that tar. You're not Disney, and right now that's a good thing. Oh, wow. Sarah, come back! Sarah is ashamed she almost got her friends killed, especially when they would gladly do so on their own. It's Sharp Tooth! Let's get rid of him once and for all. Oh, you know, maybe we can say we like him to his face and then tweet we hate him online. <laughs> they run towards a giant lake and try to push a boulder on his head to drown him. The boulder is too heavy, but Sarah returns to give an extra push, yeah. and even Dimitri finally learns to fly to fight him off. <laughs> Kinda like the Snyder Cut, I like everyone has a role to play in the climax. If one character was gone, they wouldn't survive. Mm. Everyone has to pull their weight in order for this to work. Littlefoot. Mother! Just as Littlefoot's ready to give up on the Great Valley, he swears he hears his mother calling to him. And sure enough, the Great Valley was in his heart the whole time- Nah, it's around the corner. The Great Valley was all they dreamed it would be. Enough tree stars to feast on forever. And we do mean forever! Uh, yeah, seriously. This is our new brother's fight! He'll eat about 90% of our rations, but the merchandise will be through the roof! The ending's just as warm and earned weird? as it should be, as the misery they all went through finally pays off, and the lost are finally found. And yeah, I think that's why the film's been resonating with me so much. It knows how to make the characters truly lost, but never hopeless. Like I said, I swear I wasn't saying what I said before to get pity, but rather to show there really is something to stories and media reflecting back our own journeys. Yeah. Okay, many of us aren't separated from our families and have to go on these grand adventures, but they help us out by sympathizing with us in different ways. You truly feel how lost these <clears throat> characters are, both physically and emotionally. And that can be very relatable. Everybody understands that feeling. And well, sure, it's not doing anything really new, it's just doing it really well. The characters are likable, the animation spectacular, and the emotion yeah. appropriately varies from intense and depressing to uplifting and heartfelt. It's also gonna sound weird too, but it's impressively short. The film is just a little over an hour, and it feels like so much was accomplished know, in that right? amount of time that you'd swear it was longer. It was made at a time when Disney was leaving a void that needed to be filled. In fact, a lot of people argue this film was much more like classic Disney than the actual Disney film that came out that same year. A big part of that comes from the film knows not to lie about how overbearing the challenges of life can be, but still remind you they can be overcome. 
I find myself sympathizing with more and more stories like these, particularly with characters who are still trying to figure out the world because they don't always have the proper guidance they need. They stumble and don't always make the right choices, but you see them learn and grow as a result of it. Land Before Time takes that back to the basics, as basic as it can get, the beginning of all things. So you can connect with a timeless journey that always has been and always will be continuing in one way or another. It's a solid adventure with solid leads and a solid message about finding what you thought may never be found. <laughs> I'm a nostalgia critic, I remember, so you don't have to. Whew. I flied? <laughs> I, 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 I'm kind of surprised you didn't talk about the original concept for this movie. Uh, so the original movie actually was the original concept, especially for the ending, was that Littlefoot was actually supposed to get to the Great Valley before. You remember that scene where he walks away after he loses the fight to Sarah? He's sp still supposed to be crying. And then he runs into that scene where his mother's ghost goes, little foot, little foot. And uh, then he sees Great Valley. But then he was supposed to like run back and go rescue all of his friends and then lead them back. And you see why that, so not, that sounds good at the beginning, but at the end it kind of all falls apart. You know, it kind of messes with the pace of the movie. It, uh, it lessens the impact of the reveal of the Great Valley. So that's why uh, they, they changed it around. There was like a couple of other like deleted scenes. There uh, actually originally, if for all those uh, you, who don't know, this movie was actually supposed to be, uh, the, the Great Valley was actually supposed to be an allegory for heaven because all the dinosaurs were dead. As if this movie wasn't sad enough. But yeah, it, it, Drew, that would have, that would have been so sad for everybody, man. Oh, if they made it like a uh, what, what what's that? The fire Lord of the Fireflies. I I don't remember that. The Fireflies, Grave of the Fireflies, Grave of the Fireflies movie. That that sad movie, like kind of like that. Wow. Um, <laughs> but anyway. I, I this movie honestly need, still needs more attention and that's why I'm trying to show it to my uh, my nephew and like we need to show our kids uh, going forward this movie and at least this movie not to get into all the crappy sequels if anything I think you watch till maybe 10 and you'd be okay yes that's right I'm an addict ah. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway uh, what do you think of this movie and how did this movie affect your childhood? Because I know a lot of you saw this when you were a kid and I know it affected a lot of you. So let me know in the comments below. And remember, please, smash that like button if you want to see more sexy and mini content and subscribe if you think I deserve it. And I'll see you all in the next episode.